appreciate that. Um, we've been on a series here called Besties, uh, and I get the lucky opportunity of talking about conflict resolution. I'm not exactly sure why, other than maybe Jack and I need to talk afterwards about some conflict that I wasn't even aware of. I'm not sure, but uh, resolving conflict is something that I never actually learned. Uh, Do you ever have a class on resolving conflict? I know there's probably seminars you can go to, especially with the whole restorative justice thing that's, that's big these days, but really, I was never taught uh, anything about, I never had a class in school, but conflict is everywhere. It's everywhere, right? It's nationally, it's internationally, it's in the lobby, it's on I-25. I mean, there's conflict all, it's in our relationships, it's in our families. Conflict is everywhere, but it's curious that we've never been really taught how to resolve it. But I think the Bible has a few things to teach us about it, and and I want to go over those uh, this morning because it's essential to our happiness. It's essential to our happiness. Conflict resolution, resolving conflict, dealing with conflict, doing those things in our lives that, that as best we can resolve conflict is essential to our happiness. No matter how successful we seem, if our relationships aren't good, we're not good deep down. And the biggest thing that disrupts relationships is conflict and unresolved. Most of the times we think if we just ignore it, it'll go away. That's not true most times. Most times it's not true. I never learned how to resolve conflict as a kid. I grew up in a long time ago, and my brothers and I would fight it out. We would just fight it out. I I imagine if if I was growing up today, uh, you know, child services would have been called on our house, I guarantee you, because we were fighting a lot. But we grew up okay. I mean, I, relatively, we made it through. Uh, I, I remember one time, my mom, I, I can't even believe this, my brother and I were in this fight, and he was choking me. Not to death or anything like that. It was just a mild choke, as brothers can do. <laughs> but my mom comes out and like, what's the matter? What, what the heck's wrong with you guys? What's going on? And, and you know, I'm crying and everything, and, and my, brother-in-law, my brother gets in trouble, man. He gets in so much trouble. But my mom didn't know. Is she didn't know how to resolve she, I had kicked him in the eye about two minutes before he started choking me. So he had every reason in the world, I think, to choke me at that moment. But see, she never, that was how we resolved it. Luckily, I don't do that any longer. I've been been married for 42 years, and I don't resolve conflict that way any longer. But it's been a hard, long slog through understanding how to do this. So hopefully today we can have a few pointers, uh, maybe a little bit of wisdom as we go through this, because every one of us, I think, deep down need this skill because we all desire peace in our lives. We all desire peace. My daughter is a mother of two toddlers, and she tells me, and my son, the father of two toddlers, and sometimes they just lock themselves in the bathroom. I, you just have to, right? To get a little peace. You just want a little peace, and then the little fingers come under the door, don't they? <laughs> you just need peace. We need peace. What do they put on our tombstone when we finally die? What do they put on it? R.I.P. Rest in peace. Finally, we have some peace <laughs> in life, but I don't think that's how God intended it. I hope that's not what life is supposed to be about, that someday, maybe when we die, we'll have a little peace. I know it's not, because Jesus says this in John chapter 14, peace I leave with you. What? My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. I genuinely believe that part of our journey is to get back to the garden. We talked about this a few weeks ago, if you were here, to get back to this place where things are right. And part of that, part of that making things right is making things at peace. But see, peace doesn't come naturally most times. Peace has to be negotiated, doesn't it? You, you, you don't necessarily just get peace. We don't just kind of, you know, you know uh, Middle East isn't going to come to peace because we just leave it alone necessarily. There has to be negotiated. Things have to happen. And part of that negotiation in our own lives, it, it starts with us, is conflict resolution. Resolving conflict is a big part of that. God desires peace. And the scripture we're going to look at is in Romans chapter 12, and I love this scripture for many reasons, but it says this, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. I love this scripture because it gives me two loopholes when it comes to conflict resolution. The first loophole is if possible. There are some crazy making people in the world, 
Would you agree? We have some crazy-making people in our families, right? We have some crazy-making people at work. They just thrive on turmoil. They thrive on conflict. They thrive on justice. And I don't understand it totally. So if it's possible, and the next part doesn't let us off the hook as far as it depends on me. So I have a part to play in all the conflicts I'm involved in. So how do I resolve it? How do I get through it? And first of all, why? We'll just look at this real quickly. Why do we resolve conflict? Why, why do we uh, want to resolve conflict? Because un, uh, unresolved conflict interferes with my relationship, my fellowship with God. It interferes with it. Not that God moves or goes away or, or hides, but it, it, it interferes with that. If I have unresolved conflict in my life, it'll interfere with my ability to have a relationship with life. If I have unresolved conflict in my heart, it interferes somehow with my relationship to God. First John, if anyone boasts I love God and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing at all, he's a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God that he can't? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Love God includes loving people. You've got to do both. We've got to do both, right? We've got to, to, to somehow unresolve conflict, and I don't fully understand it. And like I said, don't, don't get me wrong. God doesn't turn away from us when conflict happens and we're not resolving it. That's not the point. But somehow it, it messes with me. It preoccupies me. It causes me to have all kinds of junk that I carry around that interferes with my ability to have relationship with God. Not in his ability to have a relationship with me. Now, I want to make that really clear. The next thing unresolved conflict does for you and I is it hinders our prayers. I don't fully understand this. I haven't kind of teased this out theologically, but it's here in, in black and white in, in the scripture. Uh, it, it's, it's in the message version. I'm going to read that because it's kinder and gentler uh, to us in, in, our, in our sensibilities. But First Peter, it says this. The same goes for you husbands. Be good husbands to your wives, honor them, delight in them. As women, they lack some of your advantages. Now, don't send me emails about this. I'm just reading the text, and I chose the message because it is kinder and gentler. But I, I like what he goes on to say. In a few, but in the new life of God's grace, you're equals. Treat your wives then as equals so your prayers don't run aground. There's a, there's a concept, there's, a, there's an idea here, there's a principle here that if we have unresolved conflict with other people, with our wives especially, it somehow hinders our prayer life, it somehow hinders our relationship with God. And, I, and again, I have to put that on me because then somehow it's on me, right? So unresolved conflict hinders, uh, uh, hinders our prayers, Unresolved conflict causes unhappiness. This is obvious. We've all heard the adage, unhappy wife, unhappy life. And it goes the same for husbands. They just can't find anything that rhymes with husbands, so they didn't make that part of it up. <laughs> I'm just wanting to put it out there, ladies. But it's true. If we have conflict in our life, especially in our closest relationships, especially in our, in our families, it causes unhappiness. It causes a lack of peace in our lives. It causes turmoil. So that's another reason. And the last reason, it's contrary to our calling as Christ followers. It's contrary to what we are called by, by, by Christ to do in the world. Check out this scripture. 2 Corinthians says this. See, as Christ followers, we're called to bring together, right? A part of our calling, part of the kingdom of God isn't separating and, and dispersing and, 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 and tearing apart. The kingdom of God comes into the world to bring together, to reconcile our relationship to God, our relationship to other. First, Second Corinthians says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. All this from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. God has given to you and I, who are Christ followers in this room, who, who have decided that you want to live like Jesus and adhere to his teaching to the best of our ability, that we have a responsibility to be reconcilers 
conflict resolution, or that's not a word, but you get the idea. People who resolve conflict in the world is part of, uh, of who we are. It's part of our DNA as children of God. It makes us truly human. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who go about making peace, not turmoil and conflict. But it's hard to do. It's difficult. It takes work. It takes negotiation. It takes practice. It takes all kinds of things that we naturally shy away from, I think, as humans. I don't fully understand that, why we shy away from it. It is actually part of who we are as children of God. But many things in our lives are like that, aren't they? The very things that we really know deep down we should be doing are difficult for us to do. How do we resolve conflict? A few thoughts. There's tons of stuff out there I know that you can look at, but a few thoughts that I had as, as, as I was going through this. And the first thing, if we're going to resolve conflict, the first thing, and it may seem obvious, is we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to take it to God. Some conflicts may end up not even needing a meeting. Some conflicts, if we truly take it before God, the one who loves us the most, the one who gazes at us with, with love in his eyes, if we take it to him, maybe the situation isn't actually that big of a deal. I'm not saying ignore it, because that's what I would do. Well, I prayed about it, and I can just ignore it. If it keeps coming up, you shouldn't have ignored it. But sometimes we can get just, sometimes, a lot of times in my life, internal conflict causes external conflict. There's something not right in my heart. Something going on in there, and the situation that I have with, with my family member or someone at work is me. And, and if I can get God healing in that area, there's no need to have the next steps to resolve the conflict. As far as it is possible, as far as it depends on me, and if it depends on me to just kind of, to just not even have to, it affect, then I can move on. So pray first. Ask, is there, is there something in me that needs to die? Is there something in me, is there something I'm holding on to that is causing this? What's going on in me? Pray for the right attitude. Pray for the attitude of humility and love as I go into the situation. Because even if it isn't, isn't resolved, and a lot of times it's not, a lot of times you still have to do the hard stuff of talking it through, of trying to resolve it, of negotiating it, right? But at least I have a heart change. My conflict resolution technique normally is to prove I'm right and to get them to submit to my will. That's, that's horrible. <laughs> That's horrible. So I need a, a gut check. I need to go in there asking God for his heart. I need to go in there asking to walk in, in a spirit of humility. And we'll talk about that a little more in a bit. But if nothing else, to receive the grace that I need to walk into the situation. James 4 says this, Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That if I'm going to walk into a conflict resolution situation, no matter where it is, if I walk into it with humility, Grace will be there. It may not be resolved. It may be impossible. That, that, that the scripture says, as far as it's possible, it may be impossible. But if we're going to try and resolve conflict, we need to walk into it with the right attitude, which is an attitude of humility, so there will be grace. The next thing that we need to do is take the initiative. Many times I wait around for someone to come to me. There's a conflict. They need to come to me. I'm not going to them. They need to come to me. They did the wrong thing, right? No. <clears throat> if we want to resolve conflict, we need to take the initiative. Take the first steps. Again, we can't ignore it if it keeps coming up. And I know nobody likes conflict. Nobody likes to deal with conflict. The worst words that you can hear is, we need to talk, right? Your boss comes in your office, we need to talk. Don't leave until we talk, right? I hate, you know, no one really, I don't, there's a few people, I guess, who like conflict, and they're probably the impossible ones, I suppose. But anyway, nobody really likes conflict or to try and resolve conflict. We shy away from it. We, we, we move away from it. It's been our, in our DNA. It's kind of been our, our nature since the fall. In, in the garden, if you remember the story of the garden, I love going back to the garden because I, I love to put that up as our kind of our, this is the way things could be or should be, Right? In the garden, after the fall, if you remember, 
God comes down and nothing, there was a conflict there. Something was going on. They had sinned grievously against God who did nothing but love them and provide for them, Adam and Eve, and this, as the story goes. And, and God comes down for their regular meeting in the afternoon to walk in the cool of the day as, as, the, as, as the text goes. And he's looking for Adam and he's calling for him and he can't find him. Adam knows there's a conflict and he's hiding from it. I heard you were walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid. He says because he was naked, I think it's because he knew there was a conflict there and he was hiding from it. So we don't all like conflict, but in order to resolve it, we need to take initiative. Jesus teaches us in Matthew, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. This is important. Side note. When we have conflict with someone, we normally like to pull in all of our friends in the conflict before we go to the person. That's not a good idea, right? And we know that in our heads, but yet we try and do that a lot of times. Go to the person between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. You have restored them. You have brought them into right relationship or a better relationship, or at least you've decided to agree to disagree and move on, right? As you move into this and take the initiative, then one of the most important things that we can do is seek to understand and restore. Restore. Remember, we are, as, as in our DNA, is this idea of being reconcilers, of, of bringing things together. So our, our, our idea of going into a conflict resolution situation needs to be, and we need to get to the place, and maybe we need to stay on our knees for a little while longer until we're ready to go into the initiative part, is to restore to understand and restore. Many times when I go into a conflict resolution, I sound like I have a lot of conflict in my life. I work in a middle school, and there's a lot of conflict in a middle school. And I deal with the conflict all the time between people, and I'm bringing them together. That's why it is. I'm not, I don't have a lot. I don't think I have a lot. Do I have a lot of conflict in my life? You don't have to answer that out loud. Um, but I, if, I, if I go into the situation to seek to understand the other person, and the situation from a different perspective. Because my reality is my reality, right? If I am in a situation, my reality is truth to me, and I deeply believe what happened is exactly what happened. But if I try and go into a situation a little bit open-minded and understand a little bit more about where that person's at and where they're coming from and all those things, maybe my attitude toward it is different. And it allows me to go to the next step. Because if I go into the trying to restore and understand instead of being right, I can get to the next step, which is possibly ask forgiveness. Ask forgiveness. Ask forgiveness for my part in that situation. My part in the conflict. It does a lot to even vocalize those words. The 12 steps, if you're familiar with the 12 steps of AA, one of those is ask forgiveness, right? of many people. I've gotten phone calls out of the blue from people who are, going, who are doing the steps, asking my forgiveness. They're asking, yes, asking my forgiveness for something that I, quite honestly, don't even remember happened. But it's healing for that person, right? And so we have to understand that more than likely, if you're in a conflict, it isn't all 100% the other person's part. And we're doing our part, right? According to what the scripture says, do your part. However it is in your power to resolve the conflict, you do it. And maybe it's asking forgiveness. Matthew 7, why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? A log in your own eye. And then next, we need to remember who they are and who you are entering into that situation. I love C.S. Lewis. In, in, in his, his book, The Weight of Glory, he describes human beings in a way that just blows my mind. Blows my mind. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. 
All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities that it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But as immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit, immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. C.S. Lewis, I believe, articulates God's view of humanity. There is no one we ever deal with that is not the beloved of God, no matter where they are, no matter what they've done. It's hard to get our minds around when we think of all the people we deal with in a day and all the people who drive I-25 on the way to a Broncos game, but they are. And if we enter into a conflict resolution situation with our boss, understanding that we are beloved of God and nothing changes that and that they are beloved of God, they are an immortal creature worthy of our respect. It may change the situation completely. So we remember who they are. We assume the best, not the worst as we enter into it. And lastly, lastly, when it's all said and done, we let it go. We let it go. I have four granddaughters, five and under, so please don't sing the song, (laughs) as I may develop a twitch, but let it go. See, that's the beauty of the scripture. If possible, so far as it depends on me, live at peace with everyone. So if there's conflict in my life, and turmoil in my life, and if it's possible, and they're not one of those crazy makers in our lives that just thrive on it, and we've done all these things as best we can to check our heart and take it to God and to walk into it with humility and own our part of it, let it go. I had a situation at work that was horrible, I know. I had a situation at work just last week where I was trying to resolve something with a teammate, and they just would not accept my apology. I was apologizing to the person, and they kept hammering me with what I had done. And I was tr- I'm like, I had to stop and say, do you understand I'm apologizing? And they kept coming at me. and come- I didn't know what they wanted from me. So finally, I just had to stand up and say, I- I'm done. I-, I can do no more, right? If possible, so far as it depends on everyone. And why do we do this? Why do we resolve conflict? Because it's a big deal to God. It's a big deal to God, a really big deal to God. There's a scripture here in Matthew that blows my mind about conflict resolution. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. If you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Reconciliation takes priority over worship in God's mind. And it's more than worship. In, in, the, in the first century Jewish culture, the sacrifice was more than worship and, 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 and rejoicing in our relationship with God and all those things. It was the thing that restored their relationship with God. Offering the sacrifice at the altar for the priest to do that meant they had right relationship again with God and they could be, move on with their relationship with God. It was a bigger deal than just our, what we think, we think of worship as songs and that's part of what worship is. But in the first century writer, Jesus' mind, it was bigger than that. And it's a really big deal to God that we resolve conflict in our lives. And we know practically why because we can't sleep at night. We know practically why, because it interferes with our work relations. We know practically why, because it eats us up. But realistically, in, in the heavens, it's a really big deal. Right up there with our relationship with God. Because you and I are called to be reconcilers. As much as it is possible for us to do. 2 Corinthians 5 
He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. That we can not only just make our lives better and live at peace in our own hearts, in our own minds, in our own lives, but it can somehow have a ripple effect as it goes out from us. See, as most things I've found out in my Christian walk over the many years is it it starts small. It starts with little things. It starts right here, right? And as we do those little things, those seemingly innocuous things in our lives, it changes us and it changes those around us and it has a ripple effect in the world. And that's what we are called to be is to be the yeast or, or, or the mustard seed, or you go through all the biblical uh, impressions of who the, what the kingdom of God is, as Jesus teaches, it's small, and it's little, and it's seemingly insignificant, but it has huge ramifications. The same with reconciling, the same with conflict resolution in our lives, but we're not taught it. We, we don't really know how to do it very well. But as the band comes up, I want to pray for you and pray for us in this area. Because if you're not in conflict now, you will be. If you leave the parking lot at the same time as me, you probably will be. <laughs> Just know this, I don't like how I'm driving either, okay? So, but you will. You will endure, encounter conflict at some point. And hopefully that maybe you can enter into it in a different mindset so that you can restore peace not only in your lives, but you can be used as an ambassador of that incredibly fantastic news of God's kingdom here on earth. So Papa God, I pray right now for peace. As you prayed and bestowed peace on us when you were on the earth, Lord, I pray for us to have your peace. And God, as we're responding to this this message and to the day, as your Holy Spirit is stirring things in our hearts, maybe it's an an area of a lack of peace. Maybe it's an area of conflict that, that needs to be looked at. So God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would have its work as, as we respond. And that we wouldn't be able to forget about it, but we'd be able to deal with it in the way you would have us deal with it. And as we take communion at the communion stations in the front or the back, or or we give prayer from the prayer teams, or we worship through song, that we would not just let it go as a passing thing, that we would truly take it to you and, and seek to resolve it, seek to be peacemakers, seek to be reconcilers of the world to you and the world to each other.